Mm-hmm. So I think I think about this that you know so some uh, people are successful, some groups are successful, and some groups are not. And what they did was they did a study at MIT to be able to to test this whole theory. And they had about 100 people or so, and they broke them up into small groups. But we want to hear, as Margaret talks about specifically what happened at MIT, and see how that applies to us as the church. Because a lot of times we're just one big mass of people. We, we, come, we all love Jesus. I'm not saying anything about that. We all love the Lord. We come in this huge herd of cattle are coming in and we get all this music and this worship we're having this, we're, we're still strangers we still don't know each other and then all of a sudden we leave and we're like one big crowd and we leave and we leave strangers and we you know pass each other in a parking lot maybe somewhere and it's like wait a minute we're just like these corporations the church has turned in to a corporation let's see what she said about the study with mit so what What is it that makes some groups obviously more successful and more productive than others? Well, that's the question a team at MIT took to research. They brought in hundreds of volunteers, they put them into groups, and they gave them very hard problems to solve. And what happened was exactly what you'd expect, that some groups were very much more successful than others. But what was really interesting was that the high-achieving groups were not those where they had one or two people with spectacularly high IQ, nor were the most successful groups the ones that had the highest aggregate IQ. Instead, they had three characteristics, the really successful teams. First of all, they showed high degrees of social sensitivity to each other. This is measured by something called the reading the mind in the eye test. It's broadly considered a test for empathy, and the groups that scored highly on this did better. Secondly, the successful groups gave roughly equal time to each other, so that no one voice dominated, but neither were there any passengers. And thirdly, the more successful groups had more women in them. Well, that just goes to show you that you need to involve more women in your church to be able to be more successful, right? This is a, <laughs> this is a women TED Talk that's happening there. She's talking to the, to the ladies there. And what it is, is God's designed each of us to bring something to the table. Mm-hmm. And with this MIT study, they found out, of course, you know, some succeeded, some didn't succeed. They looked in the facts, like, obviously there must be some highly intelligent person at the tables that succeeded. Out there, they're basically saying, no, there was no intelligent people here. <laughs> the <table." laughs> they said, well, let's just add up all their IQs together. That must be it. And then they add up all their IQs, like, nope, none of them's that smart, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but what they found out was that uh, the highly successful groups had three things in common. This is something we can really understand about how we as believers can apply these same principles. These are these are, mm-hmm. these are common principles cre- our Creator cre- created. How they're called about, it's about social ability and love. He says the highly successful groups. Had, she said that the highly successful groups had three common characteristics, uh, high degrees of social sensitivity towards each other. They're not sociopaths. <laughs> they actually, you know, sociopaths have no ability to have empathy. Zero. Focusing on what somebody else has to say, relationship. Right, right. But if you don't have the ability to, I mean, how many organizations are ran like sociopaths? I'm like, there's no empathy at this company, there's no empathy in this organization. Maybe there's no empathy in, you know, church. Anyway, so a high degree of social sensitivity towards each other, in other words, are connecting. Or they don't give you time to connect. Yeah. You know, the, the way it's designed is about, you know, crowd in, crowd out, crowd in, crowd out, crowd in. And the second thing was, was it gave rough, they got in these successful groups that were empath, that had empathy in the groups, but also as they, they gave each person equal time to be able to share. You know, there was no free ride. Nobody could just sit back mm-hmm. and, and just ride off the others. They had to participate. But they gave people, you know, a time to be able to talk and, and to share. That's a very powerful thing. How many, how many, let me ask you right now. If you, if you are a Christian and you go to church, good. But I want to ask you, has anybody asked you to share? Has anybody ever talked to you about, you know, what, what's God saying to you or... Mm-hmm. Or you hear this teaching for, um, you know, an hour, and, but, and somebody says, I need to hear what the Lord is saying to you about that teaching. Has that ever happened? 
Well, they're saying successful to be successful here. Yeah, everybody needs to bring something to the table. And we'll talk about scripture that fits to that. The third thing was that they had women in the group. And so when you think about those three qualities is that successful groups have social connectivity, not social network, like this technology stuff, but you're, you literally have social connectivity that you, this is going to be shocker. I mean, you might not believe this, Steve, but you can actually enjoy going to church. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know it's like crazy, right? Oh my gosh. Can you imagine? Oh, and, well, here, go ahead. Go ahead. No. I was going to say, hearing her talk, I mean, I hear relationship and humility. I mean, for someone to actually take the time to be like, like you're saying, I want to know what it is that you hear and versus just saying somebody talking for 45 minutes and then everybody leaves. It's just like everybody could have completely missed what was just said versus just like having that relationship. Instead, what you said before, we're all going to one location, all as individuals sitting down an hour or however long later, we're all getting up and leaving. And it's like, imagine if we had that relationship beforehand the other six days of the week to actually care about where that person is. And then during that time of God speaking, it's like you realize having a conversation and Holy spirit moves in all that. And it's just like the revelation continues because one person, the book of Acts. Exactly. One person hears and, and Holy spirit drops a nugget in their heart as to, you know, what was talked about a scripture and one person hears that. And then all of a sudden it's, it's like, it's like a, it's like a symphony. It's just like an ebb and flow. Somebody shares something and then Holy Spirit has this revelation and it's like you're almost edifying and encouraging one another. But you and know, this is what Mark is saying in the study is, is this particular point, corporations, it never crossed their mind mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. you know, um, Bob or Susan, the receptionist, had anything to contribute significantly yep. to this, yep. this uh, corporate model that's going on. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's, and not only that, 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 it's not that, you know, it's good to include everybody. It's like, if Jesus died for them, you're important. If, I won't say, if Jesus died for them, they're worth listening to. Yeah. How can you, if he died, if God gave his son to die for them, and you don't think they have anything to contribute, and obviously they may be immature, they may need to be trained up in their character, but if you don't think they have anything to contribute, what? What supersized thing is, spirit is inside of you that's not in the other person? It's the same Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And, and so yeah, I think about this. I think about what Jesus commanded us. I don't even know if I have that right yet. Jesus commanded in, uh, what's it, uh, John chapter 13. Let me see if we have this here. We can see it. But in the scriptures, he's commanding specifically what for, for us. He said, I give you a new commandment. This is like, this is it. I want you to do this, right? So he says, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And then he says, by this, by this sensitivity towards each other, like they're talking about in this study, he said, by by this, everyone will actually know that you're my disciple if you love one another. So what she's talking about in this study is about what Jesus told us, he says, you'll function best when you actually care about people, you have empathy for people, and bring everybody to the table. And what happens quite often when you start, first start bringing, bringing people to the table is they're shocked they've never been brought to the table before. They're used to sitting at the kitty table, you know, going like, just feed me. I got my little fork and my knife and that type of thing, and just, you know, fork it out to me, and I will stay a child forever, you know? And, uh, and so... It's a biblical principle that she's talking about. You know, when she's talking about, you know, that that having empathy and connectedness, this is the most successful groups uh, uh, had the social connectivity. And I think about this. This is going to really surprise you. I know I I said this earlier, but you could actually enjoy hanging out with God's people. (laughs) You know, it's something you look forward to. It's something that you protect. It's something it's. First of all, Jesus said, whatever you've done to the least of these of mine, you've done it to me, right? So if you're not doing something to the church, to another believer, you're not doing it to Jesus. So a good thing or a bad thing. And then he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, I believe, he says, he says I'm not unjust. I will not forget the love you have shown me and that you continue to show me as you help my people 
and you continue to help them. If you're kept away from the table of participating and being the church, and I'm not talking about just Sunday at 10 or whatever, then you're missing out on loving Jesus. You know, people say, oh, I love the Lord. Jesus says, you know, it all, it all depends on how you relate to your brother and your sister. If you treat people bad, you treat Jesus bad. Mm-hmm. But that paradigm is learned like it was at MIT and these studies was, oh, I didn't realize we need to bring everybody to the table. <laughs> it just never crossed their mind. You know, they would just headhunt. I remember Donna worked at uh, Balboa Life and Casualty, my wife, and they had headhunters calling. They call them headhunters, which are basically looking for, you know, super chickens. And their job was to hunt all these corporations and find who is the best player on the team, like sports. And, uh, and they would try to pay that person and hire that person. And then they would basically be a broker to, to transport super chickens from one place to the other, thinking their company was going to be better. But what they're finding out through this understanding is God's created us for social connectivity and, uh, I know that when we come to church, I know when we come to church, we come to gather up. It's, it's a very, it's most part, most exciting time. <laughs> you know, I don't know about for everybody else. It's for everybody. I, I, I get excited when I come because first of all, there's some great cooks, you know, and I know when Jesus was uh, coming to meet with the church that he would uh, eat with them. Do you know that? And he would drink with them. Isn't that something? So, so what do you think about when uh, you come together at church? Is this something exciting for you? Is this something you're like, oh, no, oh, my goodness, i got to get my tie out and, you no, know. Absolutely. To me, that's family. To me, that's I, I have never had um, a group of people where I feel more valued because at that time, it's like, you know, what we're talking about. People actually care about you. They care about what you have to say. They care about what you're going through, that there's, there's, there's relationship. And yes, the food is phenomenal. And, but it's also not just the natural food. It's the spiritual food, being able to be there. That's why one of, one of the things too, is just like, I remember being with the church and it was just that moment, you know, Jesus says when he's talking about, um, that moment with the, the woman at the well, um, the Samaritan woman. And the disciples walk up and Jesus says, I have meat that you know not of. My meat is to do the Father's will. And it's just like that moment of like, Jesus says, my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. And it's interesting that when two or more are gathered and they're talking about Jesus, they're talking about the testimony, they're talking about a miracle of what God did in their life. They're talking about scripture or what God spoke to them during the week. It's suddenly, it's just like, he's there. His presence is there, his real bread. And it's like you're feeding on his presence. And it's just like the meat of his presence. And it's just like, once you have that, once you taste that, that's why, you know, I think it's the book of Psalms that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you have that fellowship with people who are hungry for Jesus, that want to spend time with people who are hungry for Jesus, it's just like, why would you want to be anywhere else? We think about it. Jesus said, where two, where two or more are gathered together in, in my name, not mm. their name, but in my name, mm. he shows up. Amen. I mean, who wants to go to a quote church meeting where God doesn't show up? Yeah. I mean, that's like a, that's just a very sad event. And, and what God wants, you know, of all the things that God chose to do was to save us through his own family. He wanted sons, so he sold a son. He gave his son for us to pay the price for us so we could be sons and daughters of God, which is the which is the 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 word you don't hear much about called family. It's interesting that everything that you can imagine is trying to attack the whole concept of family. Hmm. But it could it be that the church has left it. I know that uh, Ken Summerall, a uh, spiritual father to be in the Lord this past is with God now, that uh, he said, you know, you institutionalize your kids when they're young, and now they're going to institutionalize you when you're old. But in, in between that is a religious institution. Well, all of a sudden, we just institutionalize God in how we do things. And you're born into things. Sometimes you're just born, and you think it always was that way. But what you do is you go into Scripture and find out, say, wait a minute, it's not that way. I remember reading Scripture going, you know, early in this walk and saying, wait a minute, I don't see how that fits in what we're doing. I don't, I don't understand it. 
But if there is no fear of God, I want to say this outright, you need fences. You need, you know, you need, if there's no parents, you need orphanages. You need somebody that's going to take care of God's people. And people are doing hard as they, they're working as hard as they can to do that. But in Malachi, he says, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, he would send the spirit of Elijah and he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the parents to the children, and the children to the fathers. That's a family paradigm. That's a family paradigm. He says, or else I'll smite the earth with the curse. So the earth begins to shake when we refuse to be able to respond to what God's expectation is of his church, which is family. Thank you for watching the Greg Lancaster Show. Don't forget to follow us, like us, and subscribe. Go to our YouTube channels, Facebook, Instagram, Rumble, Parler, Spotify, uh, iTunes, download our app, even on Getter. Go to the Apple Store and rate us. When you rate us, more people will get the broadcast. That's how this whole logarithm thing works. And thank you for watching The Greg Lancaster Show.